This is Education Insight. I'm Lacey Kendall, your host for this program that looks at education in the Inland Empire. Today, we're taking a look at lessons learned during the school shutdowns, not by students, but by administrators and teachers. What did 2020 teach them about distance learning, technology, about human interaction and student mental health? Dr. Edwin Gomez knows a thing or two about guiding students through rough waters academically. As a school teacher and later a principal, he took a struggling desert school to the National Blue Ribbon Award for Education. In the time since, he's made it to the highest ranking education administrator for Riverside County. We hear his thoughts later in the show. We'll also hear about an innovative program created to teach teachers how to integrate technology into their work. As you would expect, when the shutdowns began, the demand on them was unrelenting. But first we meet Ted Alejandre. As school superintendent of San Bernardino County, the largest county in the U.S., imagine this. When school shutdowns were ordered, his office had nearly a half a million students, teachers, and parents asking questions and demanding answers. <laughs> Much like us today. Ted, welcome to the program. Thank you so much, Lacey. It's great to be here and part of this program. Looking forward to our discussion. What was that first week of the shutdowns like for you and the folks in your office? Well, it's been an incredible year plus in dealing with this pandemic. And when it first started, as you may recall, we had a few districts that started to shut down throughout the state. And then within a few days, almost every district shut down. And initially, most of us thought it was going to be a few weeks, but then it turned out to be a few months and then more months and turned out to be over a year, as we all know now. Mm -hmm. But um, it was an incredible experience. And what we felt um, we succeeded the most in is just continuing stronger collaborative conversations, support to our school districts, and really that trust that we have in each other to make sure that students are at the forefront of all the decisions that we make. I read that you have a background uh, in the U.S. Air Force and business services as well. Did that help you in your role in trying to manage the response to a pandemic as San Bernardino Superintendent of Schools? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, in the Air Force, uh, what's key is leadership and teamwork. That's essential. And really empowering others, you know, providing the guidance, but then having what many in the military refer to as decentralized uh, implementation and execution of the plan, where you really empower others with their skills and abilities to engage in decision-making that best affects the students that we're serving. And then in addition, from day one, we started our Emergency Operations Command Center, and my background in command and control really helped in terms of leading that effort to make sure we all came together, realized what the tasks were and what the challenges were and how we can uh, leverage our skills and expertise to support our school districts the best way possible. And my background in business services, really knowing where the resources are and how to most effectively utilize those resources to achieve our top priority. And in our county of San Bernardino, we have a countywide vision that's based on collective impact. So when we work together in collaboration with other agencies, we can really extend the resources in much more effective manners. Mm -hmm. San Bernardino County is geographically very diverse, and we have both large urban and then remote rural communities as well. Does that complicate the struggle to keep kids learning? Absolutely. You know, we have 22,000 square miles in our districts. We have 33 school districts with over 400,000 students, our smallest districts being over a little over 100 students, and our largest 55,000 plus. Mm. And so to really make sure that every district has the resources it needs to support its community, its students, is different from District 1 to District 2, 3, etc., so we have to look at uh, all the guidance that we had first from a health perspective. Some of our districts had much less transmission rates than others, and they were allowed to get waivers to continue instruction as early as last fall, uh, supporting the testing and the vaccine efforts across our county, uh, just the accessibility and connectivity issues. Uh, we know that in the governor's plan, there's a requirement for synchronous instruction, so really trying to maximize synchronous and asynchronous instruction. Looking at things like grading policies and adaptive lessons 
and other key areas to support students across the board were really key in our county, but much more diverse because of the scale and scope of what our county has. Yeah. What were some challenges that you faced that felt like they were unique to San Bernardino County? Well, first of all, just the size, because we are the largest county. And when it came to connectivity, for example, uh, we knew that across our county, we were about 7,000 devices short. So we worked closely with uh, Chairman Kirk Hagman from the County Board of Supervisors uh, to support that goal and get devices through county schools and county government out to school districts, but also having a connection. Because when you go to the remote and rural areas, they don't have connectivity like we do in some of the more urban areas. So providing hotspots and really determining the best way for students to have access, which is really key. And then also the demographics of our county. You know, we have over 70% of our students countywide that are socioeconomically disadvantaged. So it comes to, when it comes to nutritional needs and social emotional needs, we have to make sure that we have a focus on equity so that all of our students, particularly the more needy students, receive the support they need to be successful in their academic endeavors. A phrase that we've heard on the news and in the media during the pandemic was learning loss. What was done by your district to ensure that learning continued in San Bernardino County, even amidst unprecedented conditions? We all know that uh, when students come from families that have needs and resources, uh, they tend to have more support. They tend to have access to information, to literacy, to language experiences and others. And so many of those students were able to accommodate to connecting and going through an online program uh, much more quickly than other students that don't have those backgrounds, that have uh, challenges at home, that have difficult uh, influences in their home life and all of those other barriers that uh, if you're not in school in person, you don't have that same experience. So our districts quickly understood they were going to have to reach out to communities and students that had less resources. And we started a distance learning resource hub at the county office, and we pulled together all of the best resources and guides for our districts to utilize for students that needed that additional support. Uh, we engaged in content experts and mental health professionals throughout the county to support that effort. You know, for example, we started a partnership with KDCR uh, because if students don't have connectivity or weak connectivity, uh, they still have access to PBS. And so KBCR agreed to put all of their programming during the day to be aligned with our K-12 standards. And then our team of content professionals, both at the county office and in our school districts, built lessons that are standards-based aligned around that programming. And that was a wonderful resource to have. And then we utilized a platform, for example, uh, that we've utilized for early learning. We extended that to K-3. It's called Footsteps to Brilliance, but it's a wonderful literacy platform that students can use to really accelerate their literacy proficiency. So in an online environment, that was ideal uh, to have in place. And other learning platforms that we felt were effective, we brokered those resources at the county level so that all the districts can use them without all of us doing different things, really trying to leverage that expertise and support. And then we worked on things that we knew were going to be successful for students in this environment, uh, such as work-based learning lessons, uh, micro-internships, and then virtual events like STEM Up Palooza to keep STEAM alive in our schools. So through the use of those effective strategies, we thought we were able to have that outreach. But it also took individual phone calls. It took home visits. It took other types of efforts to reach the most needy of students. And our teachers and administrators were the first to make sure that happened where students needed that additional support. If you just joined us, you're listening to Education Insight. Superintendent Ted Alejandre joins us by telephone. He's from San Bernardino County Schools. And we're talking about lessons that educators learned from a pandemic. Superintendent, some folks on our program have said in the past that the pandemic has presented opportunities to rebuild many institutions better than they were before the pandemic. A, would you say that's true? And B, if so, where is the greatest opportunity for such existed? No, that's a great question. And this is where I have to really give credit to so many stakeholders in our county, including our county government, our school districts and others, because we've had a ecosystem established here over the past few years that have focused on collective impact to where we're all building these networks that are aligned together and working in unison to accomplish the goals that we set out in academics, but also uh, aligned with our cradle to crow map, which really hits the key indicators of success for every student from zero to five, K-12 and post-secondary, not just from an academic perspective, 
but also from a social emotional perspective. And so since we have those relationships with all of our 33 district superintendents and assistant superintendents, then the, the collaborative convening that we accomplish really is key to leveraging best practices and resources. And we had a collaborative convening with grading practices, for example, in December, and then again in January. Uh, we had one on return to in-person instruction in March. Uh, we had leading for change, designing equitable instructional programs in a digital era. So we had a number of programs like that that really brought together the expertise in the county to share what's working best during this pandemic. And since uh, many teachers didn't have access or didn't have the experience, if you will, um, in distance learning environments, when we went off uh, back in March of last year, um, our digital learning services team immediately started providing training and resources to teachers on how to use Zoom. Most never use Zoom. And so even those basic applications that we consider now with many more people having the proficiencies. In the very beginning, they didn't. And so we started from a basic foundation and grew and grew and grew uh, to where people really started to have some serious skills and talents <laughs> in using virtual platforms like Zoom, but also others like Canvas and others that were really effective during this process. But as a county, we really convened those efforts and lead those efforts. So as you adjusted and addressed everything unfolding during the pandemic, was there a new process or a project that you saw or an initiative that as you began implementing, you realized, wow, this is really working out well. I think we need to keep this going. Before you answer that, we need to take a quick break. We're exploring what educators learned in the pandemic and during the shutdowns and speaking with Ted Alejandri, superintendent of San Bernardino County Schools, and later in our program with the superintendent for Riverside County Schools. I'm Lacey Kendall. Stay with us. This is Education Insight. Support for Education Insight is provided by the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, a charitable foundation that makes grants to help educators and communities turn schools into places that empower and equip every student for a lifetime of learning. Learn more at hewlett.org. Welcome back to Education Insight. During the pandemic, you couldn't turn on the news without hearing about the struggles of teachers and schools and students, but many administrators, including our guest, Superintendent Ted Alejandre of San Bernardino County, say that they learned some valuable lessons that might actually make our local schools better in the long run. Superintendent, would you say that's true? Oh, absolutely. I think that... Uh when people um, think about distance learning and digital events, I mean, some worked really well. For example, uh, normally we would have 700 students attend our STEM Palooza, which is really um, access and introductions to really key STEAM efforts. And uh, in the previous environment, again, 700 plus students would attend. This time we were able to get 5,000 virtually to attend. Mm. So you have more access to reach students but the program itself and the digital format itself has to lend to that environment. And so I think many of us really started to accomplish that very successfully. And probably uh, something that's very simple is a meeting with key individuals. You know, I may have to meet with the superintendent and business leader um, or others. We're trying to get calendars together to come to a location to meet. That can be very challenging in a normal environment. Through Zoom, we made that happen so much more Mm -hmm. successful in terms of outreach. I mean, I have meetings every day with key individuals uh, and through Zoom, it's it's much simpler to schedule. Um, but the, the collective work, again, in partnering with others and offering these kinds of programs, we see will continue to be needed even after COVID ends. And so there'll be a new normal mm -hmm. where we utilize technology in the way that it works the best, uh, but still ensure that in-person instruction and in-person staff development and other areas that are more successful in person continue. So there'll be a much more balanced approach moving forward. Superintendent Alejandre, over the last year, a lot of students from all age groups struggled with mental and physical health issues. 
How has your district offered support for mental and health issues when it comes to students? I know that's another great question. And, you know, and that's where the guiding document that we utilize, it's been adopted by all of our districts and even cities across our county is the Cradle to Career Roadmap because it hits those key indicators for success. Again, zero to five, K-12 and post-secondary. And again, it's not just academics, it's also social emotional. So as we look at those key indicators, then our resources are tied together, leveraged through partnerships and collective impact that really provides the best approach to support students across our county. And during this time, it's become even more valuable because we have that as a foundation moving into COVID and we've just been able to strengthen it because of COVID. And as we um, get these additional resources, both from the state and the ESSER funding that's coming from the federal government, that funding is designed to be utilized over a 30 month period. We've already had collaborative convenings on how to best prepare to use those funds. So that we're really targeting students that need additional support and others uh, from an equity perspective on how we're gonna best support every single student in our county. So that collaboration is just going to be critical. And then the partnerships with other agencies. You know, we have a close relationship with the Department of Public Health, Department of Behavioral Health, our county government, preschool services division that runs all Head Start programs. All of these key faith-based communities, business communities, and others, all of those uh, relationships have been strengthened and will continue to provide key support to our community and students throughout this process. What about Teachers and parents, as they reach out to your office, are you finding their needs have changed? And how do you address them? No, absolutely. And uh, that's one thing that we've been successful. First, I'll talk about parent engagement, because uh, right before COVID, the state selected one county office to lead the statewide community engagement initiative, where cohorts of models were established and then um, and then enhanced and uh, continued throughout other parts of the state. And so the one county office that was selected to lead that was the San Bernardino County Superintendent of Schools. And we partnered with CABE, the California Association of Bilingual Education, and also uh, families and schools. And that partnership has really provided the model for others to follow to increase parent support. We have uh, professionals in our office that have built networks of parents to really provide them with key resources, but also build their leadership and their capacity to influence and encourage other parents to get involved. And that came about because of the uh, local control accountability plan, which is required for every school district. A key component in that has to be stakeholder engagement. And so because we want districts to be familiar and aware and strengthen their uh, strategies and efforts to engage parents, um, we've included uh, some significant resources in, in people and in people and in other resources uh, to help districts move forward in that area. And then with our teachers, we have a great relationship with our uh, California Teachers Association presidents at every single one of our districts. We meet with them on a quarterly basis to really share best practices and ideas and how we can support all of their efforts at their individual schools. Uh, we had a partnership, for example, uh, because we knew there was a teacher shortage so instead of all of us trying to compete for all the teachers out of our wonderful Cal State San Bernardino <laughs> and make it competitive, <laughs> we said, you know what, we need to have all of our teachers from Cal State, but we need to also go outside of our county and look at teachers from San Diego, from Orange County, from Riverside County. And so we have a countywide teacher recruitment fair that has been hugely successful. And it's a partnership with all of our school districts led through the county office to really maximize the exposure of educators to the programs we have here. So those two efforts have been really working well and will continue to be strengthened as we move forward into the future. Would you say the pandemic has changed the way you view K through 12 education in the Inland Empire? Absolutely. I think that uh, it, the pandemic has really, I think, strengthened our collaborative efforts and we realize more now than ever that when we work together as a team, we can accomplish so much more. And I think that, uh, you know, when we've had so many Zoom meetings and other virtual, you know, events that when now we see people in person, it just got, you get this, you know, this joy, a <laughs> sense of joy. Because <laughs> say, yeah, gosh, we've seen each other for the whole past year. And now we see each other in person. And you just, I mean, those are, everything's about strong relationships and leveraging resources. Because we'll never have the resources we fully want to have, you know, 
beautiful schools and campuses and programs of all different shapes and sizes, et cetera. But when we work together and we leverage our resources for the true purpose of succeeding for success for every student, then we can really make some incredible things happen. Yeah. From San Bernardino County Schools, we've been speaking by telephone with Superintendent Ted Alejandre. Clearly, in a teachable moment, a lot of lessons learned by educators from a pandemic. Mr. Alejandre, thank you so much for joining us on our program here today. We appreciate it. Oh, thank you. It was a wonderful conversation. And uh, again, thank you for highlighting, you know, from an educator perspective, all of these key issues during this pandemic. Ahead, the University of California Riverside program that could end up as a model for schools that need teachers to be super tech savvy. But first, we meet Dr. Edwin Gomez, superintendent of schools for Riverside County. His office saw this last year as a moment when the digital divide for Riverside County kids could actually begin to close. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Gomez. Good morning, Lacey. Great to be here. Great to be part of this program today. Where did your office have to make the greatest changes for Riverside County Schools? Yeah, all of our educators throughout the nation have really been been challenged and and have really looked at ways of of being innovative and creative during this time. I I think the the two areas where our office made the greatest impact uh, supporting our 23 uh, school districts in Riverside County, a county where we have over 430,000 students, 515 schools, I think has, number one, has been in providing the remote learning resources and guidance for our students for our school districts, um, through our Office of Education, we've uh, really provided the technical assistance, the resources, the professional development, the data access and analysis, and, and school review and support teams to assist districts and schools directly with the remote learning instructional uh, models. Uh, you know, I, I, I hate to use this word, but I think it's a, a very descriptive word. I, I really believe that our leaders, our support team have served almost as magicians and, and, and really cultivating the magic and, and working with districts to provide the support uh, that was required and needed during this very difficult time. As, as we all know, we went from in-person instruction to immediately going into this virtual realm, which, which was a nuance to many educators. But I think that that transition has been, uh, you know, done very well with the support of, of many professionals coming together and really looking at ways where we can offer uh, support in mathematics and reading language arts, science, social studies, technology, uh, visual and performing arts, uh, social emotional learning, uh, and doing that, that in a distance learning format. And so very proud of our, of our team, very proud of our districts that have been able to do that and, and make that transition. I think the second point, which has been, I, I think, a great impact to our community has been through our launching of the All for One uh, campaign which was really to close the digital divide. And so we worked in in cahoots and worked in conjunction with our county board of supervisors and with other donors and people that were really interested in closing that divide. And we raised over $10 million and we were able to uh, purchase additional computers and hotspots for students in some of our more remote regions of the county. Uh, We worked uh, in conjunction with those school districts to build the necessary infrastructure to establish permanent internet connectivity uh, with Wi-Fi towers. And so we're very proud of that work. And and I think that we've definitely made some huge inroads in closing that digital divide. Uh, But once again, I'm very proud of our educators, very proud of our community that has made uh, inroads in in creating that transition to provide students um, during the, the pandemic. Yeah. We've heard from so many different educators on this program that everybody was running around in a million different directions trying to, you know, put out fires and and, and get things going and keep students yeah. learning. Yeah. What, Dr. Gomez, would you say was the most difficult thing that your team in the superintendent's office had to address when all of this began? Yeah, great question. And, um, you know, in reflecting upon this question, I, I think the, the most difficult challenge, the, the one that obviously impacts our, our hearts, uh, you know, where I think we're all compassionate, uh, caring educators, and we want our, our students not just to thrive academically, but we obviously care about their entire well-being. We care about 
their social emotional well being has been the issue uh, of supporting the mental health of our educational stakeholders. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, many students, as, as we know, uh, through anecdotal evidence, uh, as well as through other metrics, we know for a fact that many students ha- have really uh, faced uh, higher levels of anxiety, depression, uh, you know, suicidal ideations because of the disenfranchisement, the lack of, of connection with other students and other role models within the educational system. And so, you know, for us, it, it's been really critical to provide support um, to help our, our students during this time, whether it was providing professional development for our educators through social emotional trainings, um, actual services to students and connecting them to behavioral health uh, professionals has really been something that we focused on. And so because of this need, I, I did start a, a mental health initiative that has provided that extensive uh, professional development for staff, as well as a series of activities and online workshops for students and parents through our Mental Health Matters Spirit Week, uh, we have uh, we created an RCOE uh, virtual wellness center. Once again, that strong focus on social emotional learning and mental health community of practice, and uh, really just connecting the dots for community stakeholders and uh, you know being able to provide the community resource guide. And so, uh, obviously, this is still an area of great concern for us. We know also that as kids transition back into uh, in-person instruction, there's going to be a, a greater need to transition students into that environment, uh, helping them to to create those social skills to reconnect with other students. And so just very proud of the work uh, of our team, uh, you know, very grateful that the state of California has also uh, made mental health a priority. So we definitely are, are looking forward to uh, making a huge inroad and in helping students transition back to in-person instruction. Yeah. This may sound like a strange question, but it feels like you are heading in that direction anyway. Were there challenges yeah. that were facing the county before the pandemic that were actually alleviated by a global pandemic, either by strategy implementation or the simple fact that students were not going to be on their campus for a while? I think, you know, for us, um, when I think about the last year and, and I think about the, the biggest change that we've experienced in education, without a doubt, I would say that it has to be innovation and the utilization of technology in our profession. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think prior to the pandemic, educators have always had a, a working knowledge of technology. Um, but once again, the modality of focus was on that in-person instruction, you know, that explicit direct instruction in person, the differentiation, all occurring right within groups, and and so this pandemic has really pushed us to to embrace online learning, distance learning, and and have really helped us to uh, to really understand uh, the impact that that technology can have on education. And so my hope is is that the progress that we made with distance and online learning will continue. Uh, because for for some students and even for some from some educators, some teachers, the, this delivery model of instruction is quite effective. And whether it's providing academic content or implementing virtual events, technology has proven to be an efficient and cost-effective alternative to in-person instruction and events. Of course, for some students, in-person instruction um, for them it really works. For some, it doesn't. Uh, but I think that now that we have this understanding that we've been immersed into this new world. I, I think from my uh, conversations with our, our school's district superintendents, it's definitely going to be an option that's going to be uh, on the table uh, for students to embrace. Um, obviously, in my opinion, I think in-person instruction probably works for the majority of students, but for those outliers, for those students that maybe want a different choice, a different option, then I think at this time, we're confident that, that our school districts and our educators um, have the ability to do this effectively. Dr. Gomez, earlier in our program, we spoke with Superintendent Ted Alejandre from the San Bernardino County and asked him if there were things that have started as a result of the pandemic, perhaps a new process or a project or an initiative that you realized in the midst of it, wow, this is really working out well. This is something we should have been doing all along and maybe thought we need to keep this going. 
Did you have any of those moments? You know, a very, very uh, intriguing uh, question because I think pandemics and, you know, when you're in a crisis mode, it, it really helps you to reflect on where you are as an educator, as an individual. Uh, being the, the county superintendent, it, it forced me, right, to think not just in terms of, of this virtual world that, that I just kind of mentioned, but I think it also made me think about, you know, when you have that pause and, and you're thinking about life, you're thinking about how uh, during the beginning, especially during the beginning of the pandemic, many people lost their jobs. Uh, people needed to uh, really connect with social services to be able to pay the rent, to be able to get food on the table. And so what, in essence, this phenomenon, uh, you know, when, when this phenomenon occurred, it really made me think about the importance of financial literacy. I, I think in education, we do a phenomenal job of, of teaching science and mathematics, English, French, you name it, all those A through G required courses. But there is no real focus for students to hone in on financial literacy, for students to understand the difference between an asset and a liability, uh, for students to understand the the importance of, of living uh, a life that is debt free, I think living in, in the United States of America, we're we're almost indoctrinated to to live you know that high credit card life, to live life uh, being in debt. And, and so uh, when this occurred, you know we we really thought about what could make a difference in the lives of our students and the lives of the community. And so this idea of a financial literacy initiative really emerged. And we want to be able to integrate that into our schools, to encourage it in our school districts to teach financial literacy. There was a, a report done uh, a couple of years ago, and I believe it was through the Institute of Wisconsin that, that did a, a study on financial literacy. And, and it gave the state of California, unfortunately, a grade level of F uh, when it comes mm. to uh, the teaching of financial literacy. So. Um, I, I think for us, you know, knowing that we, we have a large population of socioeconomically disadvantaged students uh, where they live in communities where, where there's institutions like payday loans and cash in advance institutions that are really right around the corner from where they live and they're very prevalent. Um, it, it's imperative for us to teach students how to be financially free, how to, you know, really focus on saving their money, how to invest their money. And so we're very excited about this opportunity, and it's something that we believe it will be ongoing. Uh, it's one of my four initiatives as county superintendent. But I think this initiative def definitely was birthed out of this pandemic. And uh, so we're, we're working in conjunction with uh, EverFi. We, we are working with Altura Credit Union, uh, which are local uh, banks in our area that, that really want to partner with us in, in, in teaching financial literacy to our students, and not just to them, but also their families, their parents. And so that we can have the, the next generation of entrepreneurs, of innovators, and, and individuals that are financially free. Boy, economists will be happy to hear you saying that. <laughs> they sure will. <laughs> we hope so. Yeah. If you just joined yeah. us, you're yeah. listening to Education Insight. We're speaking by phone with Dr. Edwin Gomez. He is the superintendent of Riverside County Schools. And today we're talking about lessons learned by educators in the midst of our pandemic and shutdowns. This past year was so hard for high school seniors. We saw it on television. Yeah. We heard their woes of missing so much of such an important year in their lifetime. Sometimes mm -hmm. disrupting their plans to transition to college. What has your district done to help those students specifically? Think about that for a minute as we take a quick break. We'll be right back with Dr. Edwin Gomez, Superintendent of Schools for Riverside County. We're talking education, and this is Education Insight. Support provided by College Futures Foundation, working to catalyze systemic change, increase college degree completion, and close equity gaps so that the dream of opportunity can become a reality available to every student, regardless of zip code, skin color, or income, at collegefutures.org. Welcome back to Education Insight. 
Today, we're speaking with the two most influential K-12 leaders in Inland Empire education to find out what was learned during the pandemic by administrators and teachers that might be used to make education better for the Inland Empire in coming years. Riverside County Superintendent of Schools, Dr. Edwin Gomez, is with us now. Before the break, I was asking what your concern is for the student seniors who lost that ever important senior year of high school and what your office might be doing to address their struggles. Yeah, yeah. You know, this this has been an incredibly uh, tough year for our seniors, and I, I, I commend them on, on having that tenacity, having that, that will, a power to, to really push through the, um, the challenges of the, the, the pandemic. And, and obviously, the, there has been disruption that has come as a result of it. I, I will just say that I'm pleased to report that our countywide graduation rate has remained consistent at, at 90% and above. Uh, we do have the highest graduation rate for large counties in California. Uh, we have seen more students taking a gap year from high school graduation to college enrollment. And I think that this work and this progress and this stability and this success is really attributed to our college and career readiness unit, which is committed to supporting school counselors and educators by providing professional development and much needed resources on vital topics and obstacles um, facing students and staff. Uh, we have, uh, I, I think, uh, provided many of our counselors the resources, toolkits, and the support really needed to, to navigate COVID-19. And uh, our college and career readiness team ha has streamlined uh, essential information and topics uh, to our educators across our county, given them these tools that I think have really been applicable. They've been pragmatic. Uh, they've been used to really help students understand the, the nuances of, of getting into college. And, um, and so we're very excited about that. And I think also the integration uh, with the academic, the social, emotional, and, and the college and career readiness um, tactics that we have, I think have also made a very powerful way um, to, to help students move in this direction of uh, students pursuing their post-secondary education or career plans. I would also add that in addition uh, we have our California Student Opportunity and Access Program, which is known as CalSOAP. Uh, we have a partnership with them and also with uh, GIA uh, to improve the flow of information about post-secondary education. Uh, we also integrated financial aid discussions. And, and obviously, our goal has been raising the achievement level of low-income elementary and secondary uh, school to students to um, really uh, uh, attain uh, the accessibility to college. And, and so we're very proud that, that first-generation families uh, are getting their kids into college. And um, the, uh, the Riverside County Calso Program Consortium members uh, in include many, many school districts in our county, uh, school districts such as Hemet, Moreno Valley, Marietta Valley, Paris Union, San Jacinto, Temecula, and Valverde. And they've just done an outstanding job of working with high, our, our high school seniors and, and really helping them to understand how to continue on the path of college enrollment. Of all these changes and innovations, what could residents of Riverside County be seeing in the next few years that might never have happened had this pandemic not happened? Yeah, and, and I think once again, in, in addition to the the emphasis on technology and and, and really looking at that um, and, and how that impacts career pathways and our CTE programs, I, I think we've expanded opportunities in those areas where it's making it more accessible for students to to really embrace a career pathway while they're working on their academics. And sometimes, as educators, we think that. Students are just limited to one modality uh, or one pathway of a career education. Why not integrating them? So I, I think this huge plethora of advancement in the area of technology has really broadened the horizons of our educators' minds. It will offer more opportunities for um, enrollment, uh, accessibility to courses, and I would also say that as a result of this, uh, you know, my launching of the four initiatives to, to really support student success, uh, I, I mentioned the mental health, I, I mentioned financial literacy this morning, 
But I think the other two that I wanted to just quickly talk about that I think will be powerful in, in this new dawn or this new era, per se, mm-hmm. is is literacy by fifth grade. Uh, you know, I think educators are, are familiar with the adage that students should learn to read by third grade, and after third grade, uh, they should read to learn. However, the truth is many students are not reading at high levels of proficiency by third grade. I think this pandemic has only negatively impact this phenomenon. I think it's kind of made it worse. And, and so we know that there is a, a, an academic regression per se that has taken place. And so at RCOE, our focus is on providing educators with the appropriate professional development to teach reading during this time of distance learning. Uh, we embrace the, uh, the concepts of, of Mike Schmoker, who is an educational uh, leader and talks about the importance of authentic literacy, which is the mastery of writing proficiency, uh, reading proficiency, and and being able to think and helping kids to process and helping kids to synthesize, helping kids to communicate and express themselves at high levels uh, of proficiency is so powerful. And then the the last um, initiative that we're focusing on at RCOE is equity and inclusive practices. Obviously, everything that has transpired in the last year with the the racial and social uh, unrest that has historically impacted our nation. Uh, you know, our focus is really to train our, our educators in integrating the concepts of, of equity into policy, into practices, uh, while developing an appreciation for other cultures, languages, orientations, and backgrounds, uh, embracing the diversity uh, within Riverside County, and so speaks to just building those humanizing pedagogy elements such as compassion, uh, such as empathy, uh, understanding. And, and so I think that those will be very, very key uh, factors in, in helping our students and, and our community uh, reach a different level of, of understanding. Our guest today is Dr. Edwin Gomez. He is the superintendent of Riverside County Schools. And we've been talking about lessons learned because of a pandemic, and in particular, lessons learned by educators specifically. Dr. Gomez, thank you so much for joining us on our program today. We really appreciate it. Uh, It's been a true true honor. Uh, Lacey, thank you for for the time today. Mm -hmm. As we were preparing this show, We wondered how optimistic those who assisted local teachers with their tech skills at the onset of the pandemic might be about distance learning now. We found most to be somewhat optimistic. Perhaps the most excited was Dr. Richard Edwards, who coincidentally runs a program called the Excite Center at UC Riverside. They led a collaborative charge to get instructors there up to par. In the aftermath, Dr. Edwards sees the future of distance learning as very exciting. We have been able to keep our universities and our K-12 schools open precisely because the remote modality does work. Is there massive room for improvement? Absolutely. Emergency remote teaching is just the very tip of the toe in the water of a vast ocean of great possibility and great potential. Now, there is profound value in local residential education at a Research One institution. I'm not advocating for online to replace all of the additional benefits that come from a four year residential experience on campus, that is not something online education can replicate anytime soon. But there's a role for all this technology. And I think campuses like UC Riverside need to tread carefully, but deliberately towards understanding what role these technologies might benefit in terms of access, helping make education more equitable, helping learners with different learning modalities maybe benefit from an in-person lecture that's taped so that if they're a different type of learner and they're not great at note-taking, they can watch a taped version of a lecture. That's not anything in 2024 we're going to be doing because of the pandemic. But if our rooms are repurposed and reimagined in terms of understanding that 
the more we commit our teaching to video, the more it becomes yet one more educational resource. If that mindset has shifted, that could help thousands of learners who might be struggling with just a one-time only lecture or to have um, need improvement in their note-taking skills. So there's a lot of potential coming. What do you believe are the the most significant opportunities for increasing student success based on what we've learned this past year? What we have learned is that teachers and learners are resilient. Nothing is going to stop a learner from wanting to learn, and nothing is going to stop a teacher from wanting to teach. These are things that are somewhat innate in the DNA of people who decide to pursue degrees or decide to teach. It's a passion. It's a North Star that guides the entire fluidity of these environments. College campuses work because both the teachers and the learners are resilient. What does that teach us about student success? Um, One of the things that I have definitely seen validation of is research that started about a decade ago around grit and resilience has proven to be true. When students want to learn, those that go that extra mile can learn no matter what the disruption is. And I think we got to keep working to make sure that we are constantly paying attention to making sure students have all the access that they need, including, you know, that they have Um, all the right equipment to succeed. One of the things I'm very proud of at UC Riverside is when the pandemic hit, we had hundreds of students who did not have adequate computer technology because they were using our on-campus labs to do most of their courses. Well, when you close the campus, then you have this whole cohort of students who don't necessarily have a great laptop and there's no notice that we're going to be going into this emergency remote on March 13th. So UC Riverside created the loan, um, and this was through the ITS department, created the Loan to Learn program, where we loaned out laptops to the students so that they could get access uh, during the pandemic. And I'm very proud of our institution for doing that because, you know, there's a lot of ways that equity plays out, but at the heart of it, students have to have access to the teaching. And we work very hard as an institution to make sure that was true. The other big lesson that we learned was also on the teaching side, which is I think the pandemic made a moment in the minds of many faculty members where they started to ask themselves possibly some new questions about what works and doesn't work. And that goes back to that part I was talking about before, Lacey, about mindset. And we're just getting a lot of interest over at the Excite Center for faculty members who want to explore and build on these questions that have been raised by teaching during the pandemic. And they're asking questions about, hey, can I still keep doing um, my videos on lecture? Maybe I'll try a flipped classroom now next year because I really like my lectures on tape and I want my in-class, my in-class Um, time to be spent on Socratic uh, question and answering and stuff. And it's like, absolutely. So I think there's been a profound shift in the willingness of many of the instructors we're engaging with to have a heightened curiosity about what is possible with 21st century pedagogies. And I think that is all for the benefit of better teaching and better learning across, you know, our entire campus. On our next program, we'll be looking at big money and education. How much better can a school do when given large-scale grant funding? Two local colleges are about to find out. I hope you'll join us for the next Education Insight. I'm Lacey Kendall. Education Insight is produced in partnership with... KVCR San Bernardino. Our executive producer is Jacob Poor, and our production engineer is Tyler Vizi. Alyssa Silva is our production assistant, 
and Lacey Kendall is your host. Support is provided by Growing Inland Achievement, working together for inland education and economic success. And by College Futures Foundation. Do you have questions or suggestions for the future topics we should be covering? Write to us at educationinsight.org. Join us again next time for Education Insight.